Mark Rivera. Um, yeah, please call me Bruce. That's my name. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. Um, hey, Haley had set up the time for me to, to do an interview with you with regard to... I'm, I'm ready for you, man. All right, excellent. Um, I, first off, i got to tell you, I enjoyed your performance in Man with the Screaming Brain immensely. Um, okay. it, uh, I think what you do with your, the way you know you can physical acting and all, um, I think it's like the best I've seen it in years. I mean, um, you make it look so easy that I just know it must be really difficult to do what you do. And so one of my first questions is, um, in my opinion, like you, you can like throw yourself into a role uh, in front of a camera, whether it be you know adding a horrific level of screaming or or even comedic comedy with that, uh, along the lines of the way William Shatner was able to do so in the 1960s with like Star Trek, The Twilight Zone, and The Outer Limits. And I was wondering, was that something that you like trained yourself, or did you like you know how did you get that talent? I mean, because that's not yeah, easy to do. You know, if you I've been doing it now for about 25 years, so you got you got to pick up some tricks along the way. So mm -hmm. that would be the only way I can answer it is that it takes a while for actors to learn their craft, like any craft. Uh -huh. You know, and a bricklayer who does his first uh, brick wall is going to suck. Yeah. Uh, and he might get little bits of inspiration, but then you, if you came back to that same bricklayer 25 years later, he would have built bricks on all different slopes. Mm -hmm. He would have worked on expensive brick projects, cheap brick, brick projects. So, you know, you just get familiar. A lot of acting is based on comfort mm -hmm. that if you and confidence that if you're confident in what you do, it comes across in, in your work. And so, okay. if you're confident that you, you know, think you have an idea of how something should play, then then it works to your advantage. So mm -hmm. then, you know, I would say it just just after a while you're supposed to get better. Your experience, just experience of you know, since the beginning, I guess since Evil Dead or, or even before. People yeah, where well, you're now familiar with there's lots of different experiences. I've mm -hmm. worked overseas a lot. Mm -hmm. It doesn't phase me to work in another country now. You know, things like that. Okay. Um, um, high budget, low budget. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, you've been all around the world. Um, I was going to ask, the next question is, now you've directed television before, and yeah. um, I want to ask, what made you decide finally to step into the director's chair, and how did the premise for Man with the Screaming Brain come to mind? Uh, I'm embarrassed to say it took about 19 years to get it made. The original kernel of an idea was given to my partner, David Goodman, in a rowboat in 1986. Really? And uh, we sort of have been developing it since then. It's been, got, it's been partially financed like 10 different times. Wow. It really was a folly to get it made. Um, <laughs> we, we had given up on it, you know, numerous times. Wow. And it kept coming back like a bad check, you know. Well, I think it came out, I think it was a good check this time, because I really enjoyed the film. It just, I mean, I've seen the Sci-Fi Channel version. Um, was the Dark Horse... Well, it's pretty similar, I mean, the Sci-Fi Channel version. Oh, it is? Okay. Um, only because you just had to break it up to put in commercials. So, um, all right, well, I had a question related to that, so I'll ask it now. Um, with regard to the site, well, in the movie, there's a character, uh, the, the character Totea, I believe her name is? Uh, Tatoya. Uh, Tatoya, okay. Um, her character, I was just curious, like, because um, there really isn't much of a motivation I found for her, um, unless you're just going to buy the fact that she's sociopathic and she kills and she, you know, she kills men that she perceives that love that, that, that have betrayed her, broken her heart. Yeah, she doesn't take uh, rejection well. That's the best, that's what you can say about her. Uh, so, like, there's no, there won't be any sort of, uh, I don't know, expansion of, of what her character, just to give a, a better idea than just to say, well, you know, she's crazy. You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, I understand. There's just so much you can do in 88 minutes. In 88 we, minutes. You know, uh, we just went with her to the best that we could, but, you know, okay. I'm sure it's lacking in, in many respects. Well, um, that was the only thing that particularly came to mind, but uh, I was going to ask you that, um, so, so basically, um, was the Dark Horse comic adaptation always going to be a part of the project as well? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, I mean, I, I when they said, oh yeah, look, I'm, I was very involved in that because they adapted the, the comic books from my screenplay. Okay. So I, my my instructions to them were, don't reinvent the wheel here. Just adapt it how you have to adapt it into comic book format. But I don't want to reinvent this. This is this is the movie. This is the idea. Okay. Now, uh, here's a question: With the comic, with the exception of you know the character that you play, um, all, practically all the other comic book versions, you know, 
know, look very different from the movie? Was that just because of a likeness issue? You know, like sometimes people have to, um, you know, you may well, have we, to pay uh, for the likeness of Stacey Keach. We made a conscious decision to not make anything look like the actors. I see, I see. Uh, I'm probably the closest as far as their characterizations go. Of course, of course. But, but, you but uh, mo- they, they didn't try and make the other, they didn't try and make the characters look like the actors. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to ask you is, like, Stacey Keach, he brought a lot of personality, presence, to the, uh, and balanced out, you know, the humorous qualities for the for basically what is a mad scientist character. But sure. I think um, Ted Raimi um, kind of overdid the character of Igor a bit much to the comedic side, a little bit like, you know, I mean... Uh, his name was Pavel. Pavel, okay, I apologize. Um, well, uh, what I was going to ask you, but he is basically kind of like the, 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 the assistant, you know, I mean, in, in the, that type of uh, archetype, if you will. Um, well, yeah, I mean, he doesn't have a hump and he doesn't walk with a limp, but no, you know, he's, the, he's the idiot assistant, idiot lab assistant. Well, that's what I'm, okay, well, yeah, you know, he's subservient to Stacey Keach's character. What I wanted yeah. to ask you is, when you direct the actors, do you let them, you know, run with it, or do you try to rein them uh, in? I ride hurt on every actor. No one gets a free ride. But, you know, I, I happen to like what Ted does, so it's half my fault, too, mm. you know, that uh, well, we I mean, come up with a lot of ideas on the set and, and play with stuff. Ted, look, Ted's a, Ted is a guy, he's, I use Ted to make me look subtle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ted's just, very, he's an actor who goes for it, and I'd rather have that, a guy who gives you more than you need, than a guy who doesn't give you enough. Well, I didn't think his performance was bad. I just felt like it was at times a little bit too much, but, you know, he, he's I still... Doubt that, but, I, you know, I, I watch, I base it on how it plays with an audience. I've seen it about 30 times across the country now, okay. with special sneak previews, and, you know, they, they like it. it. Ted, yeah. Ted gives you a lot of entertainment value per frame. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's great, you know, whether he was on television as Joxer or or even in the cameos he does in Spider Man, and you know, yeah. and you know, he's as much of a, a, a recognizable character actor um, now as Ron Howard's brother. Except I'd say he has probably more. You know, I think he might get better roles than Ron Howard's brother does. But you know, he's, he's, also, better, he's also better. He's a better actor than Ron Howard's brother. Yeah, pro- mo- most definitely. Um, case of, like, now, all right, this is something that interested me. When I uh, I first saw the still publicity shots when they sent me the screener, and I have to. Admit I don't mean this in any disrespect. When I first saw the the photo, you know, the artwork with you wearing the makeup as you know with, with the split in the head, I uh-huh. thought to myself, it looks a bit like the Buttman characters that they used to play on in Living Color. And I, you know, but when I saw the movie in in motion, so to speak, the makeup looks great. Like I don't know how to describe it. In still photos, the makeup doesn't look so hot. But when you're watching the movie, it's kind of like when people first saw the X Men photos and they were kind of disappointed that they didn't look like the comic but then when everybody saw the movie they loved the costumes because it worked on film but somehow they couldn't accept it until they saw it in motion I kind of felt the same way my question for you was was there any worry on your part with regard to the makeup for this film that it might look too ridiculous because there is a, a certain balance of humor you know that you have to pull but at the same time if it looks too over the top or if it looks too you know for lack of a better expression you know, if it looks too funny, it might dilute the effect that you want. I was just wondering. Uh, I understand. You know, look, it's a Bulgarian photographer. You're going to get what you get. This is a this is what happens when you shoot in strange countries that you shouldn't be shooting in. I see. I see. So you, you get what you get. And uh, we hired a very qualified makeup woman, Melanie Tooker, who mm-hmm. did my makeup for Bubba Hotep. Okay. So, so she knows what she's doing. And yeah, it looks fine on film, I thought. On film, it looks and, great. Yeah, you know, and then still, she you know, who knows? It's just uh, still perhaps show things in a more naked light. I don't know. With, when, the, when the shutter is going on a motion picture camera, maybe it doesn't show you as much. I see. Um, well, I hope you didn't take that in any offensive way because I didn't mean it in that way. Well, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, so I don't take it any one way or the other. Okay. Um, I, in your last sci-fi film um, that, I, you know, the sci-fi premiered, Alien Apocalypse, what struck me about that is it seemed a bit like a hodgepodge of ideas from you know other films like Army of it's sort of like Ar- back to the writer I don't know what to tell you I didn't know okay I'll, I'll skip that then um, I was an actor for hire okay no problem I you know um, 
Basically, uh, you, um, okay, I've, I've read some uh, con conflicting news um, on your personal website and, um, you know, as well as elsewhere. And I just wanted to ask you, if you don't mind my asking, um, and, and I'm sure you're not going to, I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, but I, if I don't ask this, uh, basically, is there going to be an Evil Dead 4, and is there any truth to the rumors that there's going to be a Freddy versus Jason versus Ash or a remake of Evil Dead even? Uh, I kind of say no, no, and no. Okay, excellent. Uh, no, absolutely no on the Jason versus Freddy versus Ash. Okay. It's not on my website, so it's not. Okay. That's what, that's what I tell people. If it's not on my website, it doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, the other rumors of a remake and a sequel, they may happen, but not while Sam is doing the Spider-Man series. I see. No, so that's something that may happen down the road, but um, there are absolutely no plans at the moment. Okay. There's no start date, there's no script, there's no nothing. There's no nothing. Okay. How do you nope. feel? How do you feel about the way, um, to quote to use a Hollywood word, re Hollywood's been reimagining horror film classics like uh, Dawn of the Dead, Texas Chainsaw. If you've had a chance to see any of them, uh, I think uh, remakes and sequels are generally undesirable. Okay. Uh, the summary is particularly bad. I was going to ask you: Is there any film that this summer you saw that you liked? Uh, no. Last film I saw that I liked was Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite. That was, that was a good flick. Um, firstly, my favorite from last year was uh, uh, Shaun of the Dead I thought was a great you know it was a great flick but that's I just heard my that was pretty fun yeah if you get a chance definitely rent it um, here on television you know I know you appeared in Ellen Xena Hercules the X-Files Briscoe County American Gothic etc um, do you have a favorite character that you've portrayed on both the big or, sport or, or small screen and I why I can really answer that only by the time when I get to the old actor's home alright because I'm not really done yet but uh, oh, of course I enjoy so playing um, an old Elvis in Bubba Hotep. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed playing the Ash character. I enjoyed playing uh, the King of Thieves in Hercules and Xena. Yeah, that was a great character. You know, so, uh, and I enjoyed Briscoe because it was the first chance I had to be sort of a role model. Mm -hmm. That was a great, that, that show, to share. That, was a, that was a very good show, Jay, to watch that. Uh, that was an excellent show uh, during its time. I wish they had given it a, a longer, you know, a longer uh, season. Well, Fox tried to start paying their bills. They were expanding greatly right about the time of that show, and Briscoe wasn't pulling in the big, big numbers, so yeah. it makes some decisions. Well, at least it, leaves on, it lives on on TNT and those channels right now. You know, the repeats yeah. are always there. Now, you're touring with your new book, Make, make, Lo uh, make Love the Bruce Campbell Way, which, yeah. from what I understand, is fiction with you playing, or, or in this case, writing yourself into the story. Well, yeah, it's sort of a, a what-if book. Yes. It's a mockumentary in book form. Okay. Where I play myself, and the, the, the hypothetical question is, what would happen if you took a B-movie actor, meaning me, mm -hmm. and put him into a big A, a picture directed by Mike Nichols, produced you know, by Paramount, opposite Renee Zellweger and Richard Gere, what would happen? And the mm -hmm. answer is that it's, it's not a good idea. <laughs> it's a misadventure. Do you, do you really feel that way? Or if you, uh, no, not at all. Oh, okay, it's just a, it's just a story. Okay. Cause I, think I, you, I, don't, I don't even want to be in any movies anyway, so it doesn't matter. Really? I mean, because I, I think that you could hold your... I mean, I, I think you could hold your own with these people. The, yeah, what anybody. is so attractive about being in an A movie? All the A movies are B movies now. That's, you, know, you dress up like a bat and fly around Gotham City. I got news for you. That's a B movie. That's true. That's true. Tom Cruise can jump up and down on Oprah's couch all he wants. <laughs> Summer, he, he starred in a B movie. The yes. Aliens Invade the Earth. That is no different than the movie you mentioned, Alien Apocalypse. Alien Apocalypse. That's true. It well, has more zeros on the end of the budget. Yeah, and Steven Spielberg's name. Yeah, I'm well, once it heard. doesn't matter. No, no, no I understand. Aliens Invading the Earth. It's, 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 well, it's a perennially B movie idea. Well, it, Lloyd Kaufman had a, a, a. He felt that sometimes there was a, a kind of a, um, hypocrisy artistically between the films he makes and uh, the films that, like, say, Steven Spielberg makes. And he was saying, look, my films may not be the greatest films in the world, but I got to tell you, I fell asleep during AI. And, uh, and I wasn't the only one. You know, that sort of thing. And well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, people can make fun of B movies for how cheesy they are, but 
these days they're, they serve as the only petri dish for original ideas out there. Oh, absolutely. And I agree as a result, I think that they'll always be around because there's only so much people can take. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much of a Herbie the Love Bug and the Longest Yard and the Bad News Bears and the Honeymooners and the Bewitched and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, every movie I've listed to you is a remake of an idea that Some is television. at least 30 years old. Yeah, absolutely. So the audience, you know, they're not that dumb. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, Hollywood is down 10%, and they're blaming it on piracy. They should blame it on themselves. You're, you're absolutely right about they that. they got serious soul searching to do. They, Otherwise, they're going to lose their shirt. They're, they're sabotaging their, their own home video industry with DVD and the, the next format because they're so afraid of piracy. But, I mean, look at the two biggest piracy issues to come out, The Hulk and uh, Star Wars Episode Three. i got to tell you, those Came, those were stolen in house. Those weren't stolen by people on the internet or, or somebody. Oh, I agree. I totally agree. You yeah. know, look, there's only so many ways you can get your hands on an actual. Uh, into the film. Yeah, and, and, and a good the back door of a theater to, you know. Yeah, you know, you, people know the difference. And, you know, when you got something that says property of Lucasfilm on the bottom or, or whatever, you know, it's that, that's where I think the most of the piracy is inside, not outside. Um, um, here, now, with regard to the upcoming CD set, you describe it as an audio movie. How, how can, like, can you elaborate on that, if you don't mind? Well, the tagline is, uh, you've read the book now, here's the movie. Okay. Um, it basically, we, it's not a he said, she said sort of audio book. I don't just read the book. Mm -hmm. uh, we act it out like a radio play with, with intense amount of sound effects and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very serious, it's, a, it's an epic presentation of the book. I see. Is there any chance that there would ever be a, like a cinematic version and with, with yourself as the star, the way Howard Stern accomplished uh, well, no, the way, private the way parts? My life would go is that Ashton Kutcher would star in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start my own movie. <laughs> um, your cameos in the, you know, obviously, I mean, your name will always be associated with Sam Raimi uh, because of the Evil Dead films and also the cameos that you've done in his other films. And uh, well, Dark Horse Comics describes your character of Ash in the Army of Darkness uh, adaptation as being a superhero. And what I wanted to ask you is, have you ever been approached, or did you ever approach Mr. Raimi, or or or, or to play a classic comic book hero or villain, perhaps, or even uh, I gotta tell a villain you, in Spider-Man Three. Characters leave me a little cold. Really, you don't, you're not into them. I like not at all. Oh, uh, because uh, I you get to look for a it. story about a garage mechanic and a guy who uh, fears kryptonite. I got you. Go just, I gotta be able to relate to that lead character. I gotta be able to somehow make that connection. Um, even though I was in the Spider-Man series, mm -hmm. I feel that that was one of the best of the bunch because it's just a guy from Brooklyn. Yeah, I got you. You know, from Queens who gets, it's a regular nevish character who is something remarkable happens to him. He's not from another planet. He hasn't been sent here. It's not Lord of the Rings, which I call Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Actually, you know, I, can't, I can't relate to those movies. They, I, after I heard all the noise about how amazing they were, I really tried to watch them. I, I couldn't do it. Really? Because I kept going, who is this guy again? Where are we? Uh, Where are we going? So do you think I mean, I was utterly confused. And I shouldn't have to be confused if I, even if I didn't read the books. I got you. So you kind of, I know that there was like a complaint similar. Like I remember uh, when Total Recall came out back in 1990, a person had an exact reaction like, all of a sudden this happens and that happens. I don't know what the heck was going on in that movie. Yeah, yeah. So no you idea what's happening. You I, feel really, I physically could not follow them. So and, you, and when that happens to me, I go quick. I got you. I turn it off. So you find it they're too fast paced in a sense or is no, it too convoluted, too confusing, too too confusing. Okay. Um, well, uh, I have to apologize in advance for this labeling, but you have mentioned it yourself, and um, it's related to the book. See, personally, I, I think when you look at you know different things, uh, like with uh, with Sam directing Simple Plan and the Gift, you know, it definitely elevated his profile as a director, and I think that he probably gets a lot more respect now. And people look at the even the Evil Dead films a hell of a lot more now with a lot of uh, 
I don't know, for lack of a better expression, you have a whole new audience appreciating those films exactly. than when they first came out. And yeah. I personally, uh, Bruce, I, per, I think you're a great actor, and I, I, you know, and I'm a fan as much as any other person. And my my whole thing is, um, do you, do you do you would you take the opportunity though to transcend that cult genre uh, persona that you've developed over no, the last? Not at all. Now I wear I wear that badge with honor. I see. So. Because, um, I, you know, look, there's a personal side to all this, too, mm -hmm. that I like having my privacy. Yes. I like it to the fact that no one's going through my garbage. I like the fact that I'm not on the cover of tabloids with Angelina Jolie. Mm -hmm. it, 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 to, me, to me, that has nothing to do with my craft. I got you. I'm simply interested in doing what I do. And um, you, you enjoy you know, that. I, I don't feel like I'm stereotyped within the industry. I'm more stereotyped outside of the film industry industry than I am within it, because, you know, I've just, the, Disney, the Sky High movie is the third Disney movie that I've done, so it's not like I'm, I'm struggling for work within the industry. Oh, no, I, I, I don't think, I, I never meant it in that way. I, no, I, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm explaining it, I'm not defending anything, oh, that, that okay. mainly it's just that that's why I don't mind doing what I do. I can have a very private life as a result. I'm actually a very private guy. Okay. And, uh, you know, no one knows about my kids no one really knows where they are what they do and I love that yeah and, and no one cares no one even knows the name of my wife you mm -hmm. know and I like it that way I got gotcha. you so yeah. if you're you know if you're George Clooney you got paparazzi following you wherever you go mm -hmm. you got people camping out and running after you and you know oh what did he have for dinner and you know let's go through his garbage it's just it's, it gets too creepy well does, but as a cult film actor though you do have to deal though, with cult fans and they can be just is, yeah, but uh, you know what? I make myself so available that the, the mystique is gone. Really? You know, if, if Tom Cruise traveled to 40 cities like I'm doing this summer, mm -hmm. most of his problems would evaporate. I got gotcha. you. Because if a fan knows that they can see me in 40 cities, they don't get ex as excited anymore. They don't have this desperate need. People only want to... They want to go through your... your they they want to go through your stuff if if they can never find you. Like, there's much more fascination if they don't know anything about you. I got you. You know, so I, I, I've been touring and, and uh, going to so many cities for so many years that mm -hmm. it, it, it deflates the fascination. And, and I do that almost intentionally. Uh, well, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting way of looking at it. I just always figured that, like, even you yourself, though, would get, like, you might be on a private, any, you know, private vacation, private dinner, going to watch your kids do something, and somebody might look and say, oh, I recognize you from so-and-so, from this oh, TV no, that show. that happens. There's no doubt about that. You you can never stop that, but it doesn't happen to the degree that it, it could happen. to not go out. When you, when you look at the lives of really famous people, mm -hmm. they don't go out. Yeah. Well, they like they say, parties. They take over a back room of a restaurant. Mm -hmm. They have dinner parties at home with other famous people because those are the only people who can who can really relate to what they're doing. I got gotcha. you. So at least they live very insulated lives. And to me, I can go to the local, you know, my local grocery store, and no one cares. I got gotcha. you. So in other words, you don't have to worry. You like you don't you don't walk around with security or anything like that. You can just be no, a free I never person. have, and I never will. And you know. I don't have to have secret phone numbers. I don't have to have my mail sent to a certain place. You know, it just... It, 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 I live as normal a life as you, as an actor, can. That's great. I, I, yeah, I, I think it is too. You know, I um, just want to say that that's a very impressive uh, and noble thing. You know, um, just because a lot of people, it doesn't seem like you really do walk the walk as much as you talk. You know what I mean? Like you sound like you come off kind of like the everyman in some ways. Yes, yeah, I want to be the everyman. That's you are the everyman. But that's what it sounds I don't, like. I don't want to be some guy that everyone's staring at 24 hours a day. I just don't. Want to be that person, mm -hmm. and so you know, I don't live in. I live in Oregon. I live in the woods in the middle of nowhere, oh. and uh, I don't live in Hollywood. I haven't lived there since 1998. Mm. And, and it gives you a perspective when your neighbors are ranchers and loggers. They don't give a shit about movies. <laughs> they, they think actors are pussies. I got you. <laughs> you know, I mean that they don't think I have a real job, and it helps keep it all in perspective. And uh, you know, I'm from Detroit. It's a land of working stiffs. I got you. 
Hey, well, you, know, group, you know, you gotta you gotta make the distinction between fantasy and reality. I live in a world of fantasy, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean I can't understand reality. Oh, of course, of course. Well, let me just put just from from a, a small time journalist point of view, like myself, I love being able to work and live in Brooklyn and not have yeah. to commute to Manhattan. I think it's exactly. the greatest thing in the world. You get to email your stuff out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the greatest thing in the world. Um, yeah. You know, and Manhattan is, for me anyway, is overrated. You know, it's congested. I, I like that. Well, honestly, I'll trees. never do another book signing in Manhattan, probably. Really? Yeah, uh, because in big cities, they can care less whether you live or die. Yet I can go to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and every other person in line says, oh my God, thanks for coming to Albuquerque. I gotcha. So you know, I appreciate the entire Albuquerque roller derby team because they want to show up because they're so excited that you're there. Mm -hmm. so you go to Los Angeles. No one in LA even likes movies. <laughs> well, and, and ironic that it's like a factory town in that respect. Because I've been there, I found the two culture shock. I, I you know, I got yeah. culture shock going there. Um, well, you know, outside of Man with the Screaming Brain and Make Love the Bruce Campbell way, I was wondering, are there any films or TV projects that, as fans, we can expect to see you in soon? Uh, the Woods is coming out mid September. That's from MGM. Okay. Uh, I have a supporting role in that. I can right. play the father now in horror films, which is great. No. <laughs> you know, as you age, you get to play other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, you look good. I, mean, I don't know what your age is and that's your business, but I just want to say you look good. I mean, even in, like, uh, you, you know, you were, like, I guess uh, in your 20s or so, perhaps when you, or maybe even younger when you did the first Evil Dead film. But yeah, when you did it, it was Evil Dead. Okay. So, like, um, but in Army of Darkness, you were ripped. I mean, you know, you looked, you looked, you know, you looked great. And and uh, you still look good, you know. God bless your genes. Uh, um, that that makes any sense, you know. Uh, it's good genetics. That's what I, I'm trying to say. Um, so you know, that's a good deal. So you so like as you go, you you may feel like you're growing older, but you could still you know play, you know. I I, I you can get yeah, away I'm with realistic it. too. You know, I don't need to play some character that's younger than me just to serve my own ego. I, I'm actually happy as an as an artist and as an actor you want to play different stuff so I'm happy to age and and get into other stuff yeah. uh, you know I I always felt that I was a character actor trapped in a leading man's body mm -hmm. so uh, now I can finally fulfill that desire to just be a character actor really to be a character is there any character actor um, that you kind of when you look back uh, that you I mean I know that pretty much like in, in the films you do with Sam Raimi they always you, know, you have references to the Three Stooges um and so I'm assuming that you, as well as the other people, kind of enjoyed those when you, those shorts when you were growing up and stuff. I was just wondering, is there any character actors, that, you know, of the past with the, when you were growing oh, up? Oh, yeah, my favorite guys are all dead. Uh, the guy Jack Carson is mm -hmm. a terrific character actor. Jack Carson. Yep, you'd have to, if you saw his face, you'd know him, but you have no idea who he is. Yeah, That's you got me. <laughs> character actors that, you know, they work all the time, but you never know who they are. Yeah, well, that's true, that's true, you, you know, but you know them by face. Yes. That's, that's amazing. So, um, you, you answered all my questions, uh, Bruce. I really appreciate that. Um, John, you appreciate the opportunity you've given me here. You're, the, you're probably one of the uh, biggest people I've had the opportunity to interview because I'm a one-man show. I do. Hey, I'm a one-man band myself. <laughs> I really am. I don't have an entourage. I don't have any of that crap. So, you know, it's, it's, it adheres to the one-man band. Exactly. I mean, I'm the only I'm the only website guy I know that actually does all the writing, the website design, <laughs> the editing, and and, and 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 whatnot. Myself and people think I'm crazy, but I I just like doing it that way. You know, it's not a control freak thing. It's just something I enjoy. You know. Yeah. Exactly. You know.